بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. My dear brothers, may Allah bless you and reward you for coming today. We are going to be talking about how to give da'wah. The first thing I want to talk about is your mindset. You have to understand that if people don't smile at you, you smile at them. If people don't accept you, you accept them, right? right. If people reject you, you accept them. Did I say that already before? It doesn't matter, repetition is good, it's emphasis. Quran repeats itself for good reasons. So let's repeat as well. So if people don't treat you nicely, you treat them nicely. I want you to enroll them in your behavior. That you become the state of being, the state of character that you want others to adopt. If you don't do that, you're not going to have that reflection because human beings are like mirrors of each other. So if, for example, he doesn't look very smiley at the moment, right? But if, if I smile, he's going to smile. For example, try not smiling now. <laughs> Do you see? I'm smiling. So you're enrolling people in your behavior. Be like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That he would smile in the face of adversity. Okay? And that's what you have to keep, keep in mind. So that's the state of mind I want you to be in. So you really enroll people in your behavior. Two pieces of advice I want you to really understand. Number one, speak to people as if you're speaking to your own mother. And speak to them as if they're better than you. Because you don't know their ends. And if you have that state of humility, I'm telling you, you'll be able to connect with people in ways that you've never connected before. And don't pre-frame people. You may see people that don't look like you, that don't act like you, that are very different. They don't even speak like you. But don't use that limited experience of, you know, I saw someone who looked just like that last week and he was really bad to me. So therefore, this guy is going to be bad to me too. Don't be like this. Be like the Qur'an when it teaches us in Surah Baqarah verse 30 when Allah says He's going to send down Adam alayhi salam and the angels say, what are you going to do? You're going to send someone down that's going to create bloodshed? And Allah says, what? I know that which you do not know. Meaning that Allah has the totality of knowledge as Ibn Kathir says. We have just the particular. Allah has the picture. We have the pixel. So don't use your limited experiences and superimpose on anybody else. So if you see someone different, engage with them as they deserve to be engaged with, not based on your pre-framing your limited experiences and ideas. Make sense? That's the mindset, people. So in your dawah, brothers, you're going to be engaging with our fellow human beings and humanity. And they're going to pose some difficult questions. Hey, why do you have a beard? Even goats have beards. What's so special about that? Hey, what's wrong with you? Why are you headbutting the floor five times a day? How come your wife covers her face? What's the matter with you? Why are you mumbling to yourself? Praying, yeah? So the point is you're going to have these questions. Not like this, because human beings, generally speaking, are very decent. They're inquisitive. They want to know. But I'm just highlighting the point that they're going to be posing these questions and they're going to be difficult. So don't just start saying, well, you know, I have a beard because it means I'm wise. Or I have a beard because, you know, my prophet had a beard and he was wise. I have a beard because it's natural. Or just don't turn the tables and just return the question and say, why don't you have a beard, right? <laughs> or my wife covers her face because it's modesty. And then the lady would say to you, you're trying to say I'm not modest by not covering my face. So don't end up having difficult questions and uncomfortable debates, but rather use all the questions to link to Tawheed. The oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Tawheed, the oneness of Allah, the existence of Allah, the fact that He deserves to be worshipped, the fact that the Quran is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the fact that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is the final Prophet, this is the basis of Haq. And whatever comes from Haq is Haq. Whatever comes from truth is truth. So don't give them the kind of fruits, if you like. They may not find them tasty. Give them the roots. And once they understand that they're grounded and they're deep and they're unshakable, right? Then they'll know that this fruit is truly good for you. So from that perspective, I want you to understand that we have to understand people in the following way. Say you have glasses. You all have glasses, right? Including you. And they're tinted pink. And my glasses are tinted green. When I say, look at that building, it's so green and nice. What are you going to say? It's really pink. It's really pink. You know, it's just pink. Now, we could have a debate on this. It's green, it's pink, it's green, it's pink. We'll end up nowhere. 
So what do we have to do to connect with one another? Exchange glasses or take our glasses off. What we want to do is give them our glasses, which is Tawheed. This is how we see the world, through the oneness of Allah. So don't just say, oh look, that building is green. Just give them the tools, the framework, the worldview, the truth in which you use to see your life and your existence, right? So don't end up in uncomfortable questions. Does this make sense? Good. So how do we take these uncomfortable questions and link them to Tawheed? This is something called initiation. And let me just show you what initiation is. So say the brother asks me a question. How comes your wife, she covers her head? What's wrong with her? And I'll be like, that's a very interesting question. You know, before I turned Muslim, I had exactly the same question. And I realized that in order to understand the answer, I have to understand the concept of Islam. Do you have a few minutes for me to explain this to you? Yes. And then you get agreement. Now you may have some contentions though. They may say, I just want a yes or no answer. So what are you going to say? What I say in this situation is this. Well, a yes or no answer doesn't really represent my beliefs. If I asked you, what's your name? Yes or no? <laughs> it doesn't make sense. If I asked you, how many days in the week? Yes or no? If I asked you, do you believe in abortion? Yes or no doesn't really represent your values. So if you really want to connect with me, and I know you want to connect with me, so you're bringing them into the conversation, then please give me some time to explain the concept of Islam, which is the answer. Now they may say this though, I heard you guys like to murder five-year-old kids and drink their blood. You're not going to say now, well that's a very interesting question. In order for you to understand the answer, you have to understand the concept of Islam. You're never going to do such a thing. When it comes to these crazy questions, negate them. Say, of course we don't want to drink babies' bloods. We don't want to kill children. But, if you want to know anything about Islam, you have to understand its concept. So you always bring it back to the Dawah. Now this is when people are asking you questions. But as you know, many of us, we're going to be going on the streets, right? And we're going to have these flyers or some flyers that are similar to this. What's your goal flyer? So what I like to do is first and foremost talk about posture and behavior. Because you don't want to basically say, Hello sir, take my flyer please. Yeah, they have to come so close, almost taste your own vapor to come close to you, right? You want to be warm, not too assertive, but warm and encouraging as if you're hugging somebody. Excuse me ma'am, today we're talking about what's your goal in life? Do you want to have this discussion today? And she'd be like, yeah, sure. And I'd be like, you know, in order for you to understand what's your goal in life, I believe you have to understand the concept of Islam. Do you have some time? So this is proactive da'wah, asking questions and then still linking it to Tawheed in the same way. So that's initiation. So now, they're waiting for the concept of Islam. You've established an empathic relationship, you're feeling with them, you're sincere, you're having a good warm dialogue. So they're waiting for the answer, the concept of Islam. So this is where we talk now about common sense. We say, you know, in order to appreciate the concept of Islam, you have to appreciate that Islam itself as a concept satisfies the intellect, the mind, and gives tranquility to the heart. Or the other way around. It gives tranquility to the mind and satisfies the heart. Anyway, you want to put it, put it. But the point is, we want to show them that it agrees with the mind and satisfies the heart. And the reason it does so is because it's based on reason and common sense and our intuition. For example, if I told any of you to cross the road blindfolded, are you going to cross the road blindfolded? Imagine playing football blindfolded. You're never going to score a goal, right? Exactly, so it's based on common sense. So get that agreement that we're not just going to base it on just pure emotionality, that one day you just felt something and now you believe that God is a spaghetti monster or something, right? It's not solely based on blind emotions, but it's the combination of both. Because we're holistic human beings. So that's common sense. And this allows us to move on to now God's existence. And we say, well, the first part of the concept of Islam is that we believe that God is a reality, the divine reality. God is the truth. And we have good reasons for this. And give them some of your reasons. Now many of you may have your own reasons, but let me give you one. For instance, we know that this whole universe began. It wasn't always here. We don't live in the 1940s and 50s anymore. We know the universe popped into existence. Well, there are four possible explanations. And by the way, the Quran gives us the logic of these explanations in chapter 52, verses 35 to 36. These verses refer to the creation of the human being, but you can apply the logic to anything that began, that is muhdath, that came into being. So the universe came into being. 
So what are the four logical explanations? Number one, it came from nothing. Number two, it created itself. Number three, smile. It was created by something else that was created. Or number four, it was created by something that is uncreated. So we have these four options and actually make it into a dialogue. Ask them these questions. So do you think the universe could come from nothing or via nothing? They were like, well, let me think about that. Of course not, because out of nothing, what comes? Nothing. If I had nothing, gave you a little bit more nothing, added a little bit more nothing, sprinkled a little bit more nothing, what am I going to get? Nothing. Nothing, exactly. So there must have been something that brought the universe into existence. Well, let's go to the second option. Could the universe create itself? Well, the way I address this is in the following way. For something to create itself, it means it was in existence and not in existence at the same time, which is impossible. Could you exist and not exist at the same time? Exactly. Also, I use this as a little joke. Could your mother give birth to herself? No. Exactly, your mother couldn't give birth to herself. So we know the universe couldn't create itself. So the third option, could the universe be created by something ultimately created? For example, if this universe, universe one, was as a result of universe two, and universe two was as a result of universe three, and universe three was as a result of universe four, and that went on forever, could we have the universe today? No, exactly. Even the classical scholars in Islam, like Ibn Taymiyyah, may Allah's mercy be upon him, he said you can't have an infinite regress of causes because you can't have one cause after another cause after another cause and that going on forever, otherwise you'll never have the effect, which is the universe itself. So we understand the universe couldn't be as a result of something else that was created. Let me make this a little bit sim simple for you guys. Imagine I'm a marine and I want to shoot a bird, right? And in order to shoot a bird, I have to ask permission from the marine behind me. But this marine also has to ask permission. If this goes on forever, if this goes on forever, will I ever shoot the bird? No, exactly. Same with the universe. There must have been an uncreated creator. And that's why we have the last final option, which is the best option, which is there must have been an uncreated creator, which makes sense of God, which makes sense of Allah. So now we've established God's existence. And don't forget to get agreement. Do you agree with this? Now, if they don't agree with you, don't get stuck on intellectual gymnastics and philosophical ideas. Our job is just to plant the seed. That's our job. We are farmers. We plant the seeds. It's Allah's job to ensure that it grows into the fruits of Iman. Don't get bogged down. Rational arguments from the Quran and Sunnah are only there to wake up the fitrah, what is already known within us. So don't get bogged down thinking, no, you have to understand this point. Just say, fine, let's agree to disagree, but let me explain to you the concept of Islam. You're planting the right seeds here. Does this make sense? Good. So you get agreement. And now we're talking about God's oneness. So if there's an uncreated creator, well, it makes sense that he must be eternal because he's uncreated. It's very simple. The second point is he must be powerful because he created the whole entire universe. There's around 10 to the power of 80 atoms in this universe. If I take one of these atoms and split it, you have a release of energy. And that's just one of them. So it follows that this uncreated creator is powerful. This uncreated creator is knowing. Why? If I drop this card, what happens? It drops. it drops. Why? Because of the law of gravity. And a law giver implies something or a being that knows, right? What's very important though, is that this uncreated creator is different, disjoined and distinct from us. Just like the famous scholar said, that creation is distinct and disjoined from the creator. Why? If I made this card, do I become the card? Exactly. I'm distinct and disjoined from the card. Likewise, the uncreated creator is distinct, unique and disjoined from his creation. Does this make sense so far? Not only that, but since he created us and he created human beings, who love themselves. We all love ourselves, right? Don't say you don't. The reason we love ourselves is because we don't want to die. We want to prolong our existence. We want to eat food. Now, this self-love should make us now love this Creator. Why? 
Now the famous 11th century scholar Al-Ghazali, may Allah's mercy be upon him. Do you know what he said? He said, your self-love should project you to the love of God, which is part of worship. Why? Because who created you? Who sustains you? Who created the universe and the causes, physical causes in the universe to sustain your own creation? Who even created love itself? Who's the source of love? Al-Wudud, as we know in Arabic. The name of Allah, the loving, the excessively loving. So you must want to love God. Not only love Him, but you want to worship Him. Because if He is the creator of the entire universe, why are you worshipping other things? I don't say you don't worship other things. Even atheists worship other things. You obey your boss, you obey your parents, you obey your wife, your siblings, the culture, materialism, the system that we live in. We all have these reference points. We all have these enslavements. We all have these kind of slavery to all of these slave masters. But if God created me, then I want to enslave myself to Him. That would truly free me from the worldliness, from the emptiness of the world, right? So this is establishing the oneness of God. So, we've established, <laughs> we've established God's existence, yes. Yes. oneness. Yes. Now, it leads us to revelation. Because if God does exist, He's a reality. He is one. <laughs> he's transcendent. He's unlike His creation. He deserves worship. He deserves to be loved then surely He announced Himself to mankind. And it makes sense that there is a revelation because we have this internal yearning for truth, for God to know who He is, right? We all want to hear the voice of God as they say. But where is it? Now there are two options. You could think about this internally or externally. So I could think, you know, I know who God is. He's in my heart and He is like this. If we all had that approach, we have six billion different versions of God. We have different hearts different perspectives, backgrounds, knowledge, ideas, cultures, etc. So it follows it must come externally. It's like a knocking on the door. We don't know someone's coming. So what do we say? Excuse me, who is it? And it has to tell us externally who that person is. Similarly, we need an external revelation to announce <laughs> who God is. And that makes sense of a thing like a book, right? Now, someone may argue, but I don't think we need revelation. Well, fine. You don't have to entertain that argument to say that I agree. But let me show you why I believe we have revelation. Let me show you why we have good reasons to believe in revelation in the Quran. Reason number one. The Quran has the most logical, reasonable, rational, natural concept for God. What does Allah say, say in the Quran? He is one. He is unique. He is eternal. He doesn't give birth, he wasn't born, there is nothing like him. Very simple. This is a God you could worship. Use what I've just said, which is from the Quran, as criteria to understand the concept of God. Filter that through, for example, Hinduism, that believes a form of God is everywhere. But we said before in oneness that God must be distinct and disjoined from his creation from that perspective, right? Think about Buddhism. It doesn't even believe in God in the first place. It's like an agnostic philosophy. So the point is, when you use this from the Qur'an as criteria to understand what makes sense of a God, the Qur'an always comes on top. It's very pure, rational, reasonable, and in line with your mind and with your heart. God is one. He's unique. He's self-sufficient. He doesn't give birth. He wasn't born. There is nothing like unto Him. That's the first point, the concept of Tawheed, essentially the oneness of Allah. The second point is this, that the Qur'an makes people think. It doesn't say, believe in me because I just said so. It appreciates the human being as the human being, not like a robot that you press a button and it follows commands. And that's why it makes you think. Read the Qur'an. Engage with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala As Allah says in the Qur'an أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ Quran. Do they not reflect upon the Qur'an or the locks on their hearts? So the more reflection we do with the Qur'an The more our hearts become unlocked to receive the mercy and guidance of Allah And the Qur'an actually makes us think وَفِي أَنفُسِكُمْ أَفَلَا تُبْصِرُونَ And in themselves, do they not see? Do they not reflect? Talks about man, life and the universe in order to conclude that not only does God exist, but He deserves to be worshipped. He created me, He deserves to be worshipped. So it makes you think. Third point, 
it challenges the whole of mankind concerning its authorship. The Quran says in Surah Baqarah, the second chapter, the 23rd verse, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبِ مِمَّا نَزَلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا فَأَتُّوا بِسُورَةِ مِمِثْلِهِ وَدْعُوا شُحَدَاءَكُمْ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ And if you're in doubt, talking to people who doubt, normal human beings. This book we sent down to our servant, referring to the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace, then bring one chapter like it and call on your witnesses and your supporters besides God if you're truthful in your claim, engaging with hearts and minds. Now this opens a whole window, an array of arguments for the Qur'an. The linguistic miracle of the Qur'an, the historical miracle of the Qur'an, the fact that the Qur'an addresses different mentalities and different ages in our human sphere, in our human life. It addresses the 7th century man, the 15th century man and the 21st century man. So let me explain some of these briefly for you. The first point, linguistic miracle. We know the Qur'an came down to an Arab to the Arabs, who were the best at expressing themselves in the Arabic tongue. This is well known in Western and Eastern scholarship. They were Arabic linguists par excellence, right? And the Quran challenged them. And they couldn't produce anything like the Quran, because the Quran says produce something like it, which is something like its language, according to many of the ulama, many of the scholars. But no one has been able to produce anything like the Quran, because it de-scopes the Arabic language. That's why Professor Arbuthno, a British Orientalist and translator, he said, although several attempts have been made to challenge the Qur'an, none have yet succeeded. So he's echoing what many other of the ulama have said. So what you have to understand is that, well, how can we conclude now that it's from Allah? We may not know Arabic. The person you're talking to may not know nothing about Arabic. This is fair enough. All you have to get them to understand that they have to accept something called testimony. Do you believe in testimony? Of course we do. I believe China exists because of testimony. I read it in a book, I saw it on a map, therefore it exists. Some guy who looks different from me said he's Chinese, therefore China must exist. It's all testimonial. I haven't eaten Chinese food in China before. I haven't been to China before. So it's all testimonial. It's the say-so of others. But it has to be authentic and valid. So, from this perspective, we have to make them understand that there is an authentic and valid testimony that no one has been able to challenge the Qur'an. If they agree on that, then you have four logical explanations. Number one, the Qur'an came from an Arab. But we know this couldn't be the case because the best Arabs at the time said it wasn't from a human being, it, it was beyond them. Like the famous linguist, his name was Walid ibn al mughira He said, by Allah, by God, this can't come from a human being. So it can't come from the best Arabs of the time. Someone may argue, what about today's Arab? Well, we know today's Arab has suffered from something called linguistic degeneration. Go to Egypt, ask for the telephone. They say, Aina telephone? Where is the telephone? Yeah? We know it's hatif as well. We know there are Arabic words for these, but there's been too much linguistic borrowing. So someone who's brought up in that culture can't express themselves in the same way. The next option, maybe it came from a non-Arab. But this is impossible. Even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an addresses this issue. This is Arabiyun Mubin. This is pure, clear Arabic. How can it come from a non-Arab? Doesn't make sense. The third option, maybe it came from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Well again, this is impossible because he was an Arab too. And all, all Arabs failed. Also, we know it couldn't come from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for many reasons, but let me give you one core reason. Any human expression, just like this artwork here, what's your goal? If you have the blueprint, you can replicate the blueprint and do it yourself. If you have the blueprint and the tools available. That's why in Picasso, in famous work, you have replicas that are very expensive and they're almost identical to the original work because they know the texture, the brush strokes, the stuff used. The Quran its blueprint is alive and well today, 1400 years on. We have the tools, the grammar, the finite letters of the Arabic language, yet we can't use our capacity and exhaust all the tools that we have at our disposal to even produce anything like the Qur'an. So if the Qur'an was human expression, someone would be able to replicate it, just like all human forms of expression. So therefore it must be from Allah, it doesn't make sense. Can't come from an Arab, can't come from a non-Arab, can't come from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, therefore it came from God. Let me go to the next argument, the historical argument. 
Now, Allah in the Quran addresses historical realities, right? To teach us not to have civilizational arrogance. Don't think you guys are going to be on top all the time. Look at the people before you. Humble yourselves and through your humility you reach Allah. Through your humility you come closer to God and you receive guidance and mercy of God. But if you think you're arrogant and you could take over the world and you're self-sufficient, that's when destruction begins. It's a spiritual element actually. The Quran engages with the heart and saying, look at the people before you. They're all rubble now. Who are you? And that's why in Islamic spirituality, if you like, according to the Quran and Sunnah, the more you lose yourself, your ego, the more you find Allah. Which means the more closer to Allah you get. Because if you're arrogant, it's a veil between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah just mentions historical stories using these kind of spiritual lessons as well. But also, amongst many other things, Allah addresses very specific, minute information. That to be honest, if you were to take it out of the Quran, it wouldn't affect the message. And this is how interesting it is. Now, let me give you an example of the two different titles for the leader of the Egyptians in the Quran. One is Fir'aun, the other is Malik, king. So you have two different titles. Now, Malik, king, was at the time of Yusuf Joseph, alayhi salam. And the title of Fir'aun, Pharaoh, was at the time of Moses, Musa, alayhi salam. And it doesn't change. It's always for the specific periods. And this is quite interesting because the historians of the time, they didn't have that distinction. The Bible didn't have that distinction. The Torah didn't have that distinction. So where did the Prophet Muhammad upon him peace get the information from? Especially when the hieroglyphics, which was the pictorial language of the ancient Egyptians, was a dead language. It was unknown. How did he know this accurate information? Because if we fast forward many, many years, we find the Rosetta Stone, which allowed us to decode the pictorial language of the Egyptians and we find that actually at the time of Yusuf alayhi salam which is the old middle kingdom in Egyptian history they were calling the head of the Egyptians the leader of the Egyptians Malik king and in the new middle kingdom at the, uh, the new kingdom rather at the time of Moses they started to call him the Pharaoh what a slight minute detail and the Quran is absolutely accurate but if you claim it came from a man like the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace, then the information at the time is contradictory to that which is in the Quran. So where did he get the information from? It must be the one that knows all of history. The final argument I want to talk about, and there are many, many more things to talk about the Quran, is the fact that when you engage with the Quran, you do tadabbur, reflection, you see that it's so fascinating, it addresses different peoples at different times. It's multi-layered. Especially when it talks about verses that God wants you to think about, like man, life and the universe. And I want to give an example. Take the word alaqa. The word alaqa can be found in Surah Mu'minun, chapter 23, around verse 14. And this word has five classical meanings and academic meanings. Number one, blood in a general sense. Number two, blood clot. Number three, clay that sticks to the hand. Number four, a leech or a worm. Or number five, something that clings. <coughs> Now interestingly, when Allah talks about Allah, which, which refers to the development of the human being, the embryo, it refers to the development of the human being. And for a 7th century Arab, they would take the meaning that it's a blood clot. Because when you look at dissections and abortions, it looks like bloody, right? This was in line with the Greek physicians like Galen, who wrote the book Dissemini, and he said in Greek, sarcoidis and emados, which means there's a blood-filled fleshy thing. So maybe, Allah is addressing the mentality of the time. Because yes, you do look like a blood clot. And wow, from this Allah formed me. So he deserves to be worshipped. That's the point of these verses. So it's addressing different times and places. But if we fast forward to the 15th century when we develop the microscope, we discover the microscope, we invent the microscope. We are now allowed, or we've given the capacity to see the embryo around day 20 to 30. Using the microscope, we see it looks like a leech. Not only does it look like a leech, but even the internal structure of a leech looks like the embryo at the same period. Isn't that fascinating? So it addresses different times and places to make us believe that, look, look who you were, look what you were, and look what you are now, so God deserves to be worshipped. But what's very interesting is this. It might not even have a scientific or natural meaning. It might have a spiritual meaning. God is probably telling us maybe, from a tadabbur point of view, from a reflective point of view, hey, 
You're a leech. What does a leech do? It's a parasite. It drains the resources of its host. And we were just like that in our mother's womb. We drained her resources. So it's as if God is telling us, lower the wing of humility for your mother because she sacrificed for you willingly. Be compassionate and loving to your parents, especially your mother. Because look, you were like a leech, like a parasite. You know what's very interesting? Professor Lord Winston from Imperial College University in London, he says the following words, that the leech and the embryo act in the same parasitic way. Isn't that amazing? Now, it may even have no meaning. Or we may not have any meaning that we could find in science or today's reality. But that's fine, science will catch up because that's the whole point of science. And it's as if God is saying to us, you may not really know what this means now, but it's encouraging us to develop scientific advancements in the future. It is no wonder the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace said, for every disease is a cure. So seek the cure. It's an, a, a spiritual encouragement to go and look into science. So we're not anti-science. So this is why the Quran is so amazing. And there's so many other different reasons that you all know about. So this establishes good reasons to believe the Quran can't come from man, can't come from the natural world, must come from the supernatural, right? Which makes sense of God. The final point I want to talk about though, is that what does the Quran actually say now? It actually answers all the big questions in life. Who are you? Whose are you? For whom are you? Why are you? So why are we? We're here, we've been sent down as the Quran says to worship Allah, which means to love Him, to know Him and to obey Him. This is our raison d'etre, our reason for existence. And it frees us from the shackles of the empty world, the ephemeral world. And the Quran teaches us how to worship God. And it answers the questions like, why is the evil and suffering in the world? What am I supposed to do? What are my moral priorities? What's happening after I die? Paradise and hell. And this is a point where if you've established good reasons for God, His oneness in the Quran, now start to talk about if you reject this freely, there are two options. Eternal bliss with your Lord in paradise or eternal suffering in hell. And then get agreement. Eternal suffering in hell. Establish the revelation of the Quran. Now, this is the point where you could get shahada now. You could facilitate them accepting reality, which there is no deity worthy of worship but Allah. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his final messenger. But we have another really powerful argument for Islam, which is the prophethood of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, and you could link this to the Quran. You know, the Quran talks about prophets. We believe in Jesus. We believe in Abraham. We believe in Noah. We believe in all of the great prophets. And we believe in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, upon whom be peace. And the prophets came to be carriers of the divine revelation and to tell us how to practice the divine revelation. In a way, in a summary, the Quran is what to do. The sunnah, the practice of the prophet is how to do it, essentially, okay? Now, you could even remove the prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace away from the Quran just for a moment and say, just look at his life without the Quran. And when we look at his life, we can use his life as a proof for the Quran and proof for the Islam itself. Because he had a claim. He said he was the final messenger of Allah. How can we assess this claim? In four ways. He was lying. He was deluded. He was both lying or deluded. Or he was speaking the truth. So let's assess this by looking at the facts in his life, the historical facts. Could he be a liar? Well, this is impossible. Because even his enemies entrusted him with things. Even his enemies said that he was the trustworthy. And he couldn't be a liar because when you look, at, look into his life, that his psychological profile is so different to that of a liar. Wallahi, to claim the Prophet Muhammad upon whom he peace a liar is to claim your mother never gave birth to you. You don't have much evidence that she gave birth to you anyway. You have her statements, your father's and the midwife. You don't have a DNA certificate, right? But the Prophet Muhammad upon whom he peace, when you analyze his life, there's so much overwhelming evidence. For example, just for the pure message of La ilaha illallah, he was tortured and abused. He was stoned by children for hours in a town in Arabia, Ta'if. He was hungry to the point where he tied two stones to his stomach. There was no smoke coming outside of the house of Aisha, radiallahu anha, his wife, for six months plus. He was boycotted from his beloved city. And so many other things that happened in his life. And he was so brave in the battle of Hunayn when the arrows were flying and some of the companions had to inevitably retreat. He was still marching forward and said, I am not a liar, I am the messenger of Allah. 
Is this a psychological profile of a liar? I'm telling you, Allah, you claim he's a liar. Don't even believe your mum is your mum. So he couldn't be a liar. Could he be deluded? Well, he couldn't be deluded for many reasons. Reason number one, he look at his teachings. His beautiful teachings. Go into the Quran and the Sunnah, specifically the Sunnah. His statements, in the authentic statements. Look about the morals. Look at when he talked about love. That you won't enter paradise until you believe and you won't believe until you love one another. He talked about spreading salam and peace, feeding the poor, taking care of the elderly and the young, being compassionate. There is no harming, no reciprocating of harm. Doing things with excellence. Talked about economy and distributive justice. Talked about essential limited needs. I mean, when you go into the sunnah, into the prophetic practice, you see so many wonderful things. And even when you look at the simplicity of his life, in Shama'il Tirmidhi, what do you have? He said, oh, how great vinegar is as a curry. SubhanAllah. So his teachings show that he's not a deluded man. Second point, there are many instances in his life that a deluded person would have used to support his delusion. Many, but he didn't. Let me give you one example. His son Ibrahim passed away and there was a solar eclipse. The Arabs thought, my God, he must be a prophet. Solar eclipse happened because his son passed away. What does he say in a hadith in Bukhari? He says, no. The sun and moon don't eclipse for nobody's death. These are the signs of God. And when you see them, pray. And he taught them what to do. If he was deluded, he would have used these instances to support his delusion. But he, does, he didn't. And there are many instances, instances like this in his life. So he couldn't be deluded. Let me give you another one actually. Third point. His prophecies. There are so many prophecies that have come true. For example, he foretold the martyrdom of Ammar. He said, oh Ammar, what a pity, a rebellious group will kill you. He foretold that Fatima radiallahu anha, his daughter, will be the first from his family to meet him in paradise after his death. And he foretold the Mongol invasion. Yeah, he said, the time will not come until you fight a people whose faces are like shields, they're flat, they've got slanted eyes, they have furry boots. If that's not the Mongol invasion, then I'm Japanese, right? Do you see my point here? So he couldn't be deluded. The next option, could he be, could he be both lying and deluded? No, because if he couldn't be lying and he couldn't be deluded, putting two wrong things together is still wrong, it's still false. So therefore he must have been speaking there. And that's how he established the prophethood of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So now you're ready for the shahada. And you humbly ask them, if this makes sense to you, it agrees with your mind and with your heart, accept reality. Sometimes, you know what I do? I show my trainers to the youth. I say, do you like my trainers? Like, yeah man, wicked trainers. I said, accepting Islam is like saying my trainers are excellent, are really nice. Why? Because you're accepting reality. Do you want to accept reality? Of course you do, because then that really engages with the soul. Like, you want to be a human being of integrity. You don't want to reject truth, you want to accept truth. So it's about self-image psychology. Yeah, I do want to accept reality. Well, why don't you accept the fact that God deserves to be worshipped? That there is no deity worthy of worship but Allah. And that Muhammad upon whom he peace is his final messenger. And then you just get the shahada. And by the way, don't make it the satanic shahada. There is no God but God and Muhammad is his messenger. No, even shaitan knows that. The shahada here is there is no deity worthy of worship. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. There is no deity worthy of worship but Allah. Not no God but Allah. No God but God. But no deity worthy of worship because they have to understand in their hearts. They have to have a willingness not only to accept the truth but a willingness to worship Allah. That's very important in the shahada. Does this make sense? Good, and once you get the shahada, remember, this is where the da'wah starts. This was the easy point. Sincere human beings will become Muslim, but now is when shaitan is at them. Oh, making them down, making them be confused. So what you have to do? Be a brother. Be someone who loves them for the sake of God. Take the number, the email, set up a meeting. Teach them how to pray. Give them a new Muslim pack. And it's very important that the first thing you do is not, you don't talk about beards, we talk about clothes, you talk about Tawheed, the oneness of Allah and establishing that link with Allah which is the prayer. Once the prayer gets right, everything falls into place and it's your job to do that inshallah.